Okay, who of you in here wants Jesus to come back? Amen. Wow, that is good. Praise the Lord. Last time I asked this question, it was in another place. I think the people were had bigger lunch than now. Nobody raised his hand. I don't know if you heard, they heard me or not, but <laughs> I'm sure they didn't mean mean that. But you know, the Bible tells us the scriptures reveal to us that something must happen. Something needs to take place before Jesus returns. Before the second coming, something must happen. A message must be given, the Bible says. Who knows what that message is? The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom? Must be preached in all the world. Must be preached in all the world. Elijah message. Somebody at the back said that. The gospel of the kingdom. Elijah message. The same thing. Same thing. But here we see in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet when? Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now this verse tells me at least two things. Number one, it tells me that God will send Elijah the prophet. Yes? And number two, it tells me that Jesus will not return until Elijah the prophet comes back. Yes? I will send you Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, Elijah must come. Do we all agree? Okay. What does it mean by, I will send you Elijah the prophet? Some people believe in the re reincarnation out there. Some people believe that Elijah himself will come. Is that true? No, it's not, it's not true. Uh, the angel Gabriel, when he came and spoke to Zechariah, John the Baptist father, he said something in Luke chapter 1 verse 17. And he, that is John the Baptist, shall go before him, that is Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And then he had something, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So when God said, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, he meant what the angel explained to Zechariah and here, that he will send a people in the spirit and power of Elijah. Do we all agree? That they will give the message that Elijah gave. Yes? And this message of Elijah, the angel in here said, will prepare, will make ready a people for the Lord to come. Alright, now, at the days of Jesus, God sent Elijah the prophet. Who was that? John the Baptist. We all know that. Yes? God sent Elijah or the spirit of Elijah to John the Baptist and John came and preached a message. Now the question that I want to ask is, why Elijah? I mean, why not Isaiah the prophet? Why not Ezekiel? Why not Jeremiah? Why not Moses? Why Elijah? What's so specific about Elijah that relates to the last days before the great day of the Lord? In the house of the father of children. Yes, yes. See, I, I can think at least of two reasons. At least. One is that Elijah was translated alive to heaven and the last generation on earth will be translated alive to heaven. Yes? The other reason, I believe, is given to us back in Malachi chapter 4. Malachi, sorry. Chapter 4 and verse 6. We read verse 5. Verse 6 says, And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. You see, God knew that in the last days, His people will need their heart to be turned back to their father or to the God of their fathers to prepare them before Jesus comes back. Yes? Because that's what the message of Elijah does. It turns back the hearts of the children to their fathers, to the God of their fathers, to the path of their fathers to the old path. We need to be turned back to the old path as Jeremiah said in chapter 6 verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old path. Where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. That's what the Elijah message will do. will turn God's people, the hearts of God's people back to the old path. The path that their fathers walked on. Now what exactly is the Elijah message and why is it needed today? 
I believe for us to better understand and appreciate this message, we have to go back and look at the life of this Prophet that is mentioned here, Elijah, and see what we can learn from him. What was happening at the time when Elijah gave this message that he is so famous about? Yes? Is that something we can do? Go back and see what we can learn. Because the things that are recorded are for us to learn from, yes? All right, I'll, uh, do, are we all familiar with the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel? Yes. <coughs> you know, at his time, uh, King Ahab went and married a queen, Jezebel. All Israel ended up worshipping idols. Ahab came in and said, uh, uh, until the Lord says so, there'll be no rains. He disappeared for three and a half years. He came back. Mount Carmel took place. And then Jezebel told Elijah off, Elijah ran to the wilderness. You, you know, this is just a brief overview. Now I want us to go through it and see some points that we can relate to in our day. We read in 1 Kings chapter 16, starting at verse 30 to 33, And Ahab, the son of Omri, Ahab was the king, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as, it, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now when the Bible says something, it's not just trying to fill room. It's not that God had a lot of ink and he wanted to use it. When God tells us something, he's being specific, he's trying to make a point. The Bible tells us that Ahab went and married Jezebel. Now who was Jezebel? <coughs> a wicked woman. That's what we know about her. But the Bible specifically says she was yes the Zidonians. Who, who, who are the Zidonians? I mean why, why is God bothering in telling me that Jezebel was a Zidonian? Who were the Zidonians? How is that related to, to, to me? Let us see what the Bible says about the Zidonians. In Judges chapter 10 verse 12, the Zidonians also and the Amalekites and the Manites did oppress you. And ye cried to me and I delivered you out of their hand. So the Zidonians were a nation that oppressed God's people in the past. And God's people cried to God and God delivered them from under the hands of the Zidonians. Yes? Then Ahab went back and married who? A Zidonian. Can you see? Can you see what's happening? Uh, I just want you to put it back, uh, lock it in your mind. We'll, co we'll, get, we'll come back to it a bit later on. Now after marrying Jezebel and worshipping idols, Elijah come, comes on the scene. And we all know he walks in the palace and he says, Therefore shall not be due nor rain these years. He walks in the palace and he gives a message to Ahab the king. I mean, who dares to walk before a king? And gives a message like that to a king. And then disappears. Elijah did. See, Elijah gave a message of rebuke to the king, right? He went in and rebuked the king for his idolatry. He stood up for what is right. Elijah stood up for what is right. After that we read that Elijah ran and he hid himself next to the brook Cherith and ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook. Compared to the diet that Elijah had, if you compare that with the diet that the king had, did Elijah have tables full of food and, and six course meal and all this stuff? Or did Elijah have a simple diet? Flesh and bread, ravens brought him. Yes? You all following me? So Elijah had a simple diet. Then we read, after Elijah came, Mount Carmel happened, all the prophets of Baal were slain. Ahab goes back to his palace, his wife is not pleased. She sends a message to Elijah and she tells him, then Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life 
of one of them by the morning. Who persecuted Elijah? Jezebel. Was Jezebel a man or a woman? So Elijah was persecuted by a woman. Yes? <laughs> We're building something here. It will come, come clear soon. Then we read that he flee and he ran into the wilderness. He was scared and he ran into the wilderness. I won't read the whole verse, but you see it highlighted in yellow there. So Elijah ran into the wilderness. He, Elijah stood up for what is right. He gave a message of rebuke. He had a simple diet. He was persecuted by a woman and he ran into the wilderness. What about the second Elijah? Who was the second Elijah? John the Baptist. The, the life of John the Baptist, does it harmonize with the first Elijah? Let us see. Where did John the Baptist preach? You can see the verse on the screen, crying in the wilderness. John the Baptist preached in the wilderness. What about his diet? What kind of a diet did John the Baptist have? Locusts and honey. He had a simple diet, didn't he? John the Baptist had a simple diet. What kind of a message did he have for the leaders? on his day, at his day. All generation of vipers, he said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. John the Baptist had a message of rebuke to the apostate leaders at his time, yes? Did John the Baptist restore true worship? No, no yes? Did he preach repentance? for their missions of sins, as you can see on the screen. He, he pleaded with the hearts of the people to repent, to have true repentance. He, he tried to restore true worship, not like the Pharisees, they go and beat their, sorry, they go and look up to heaven, I'm, I'm not like a sinner like this guy, Gentile. Remember the parable that Jesus gave? John the Baptist tried to appeal to the heart, restore true worship. And who did John the Baptist point to? To the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God, as you can see on the screen. Did John the Baptist stand up for what is right? How do you know that? He got beheaded. Remember when Herod married Herodias? She was his brother's sister. Herod was inquired about it. He told him, it's unlawful for you. It is unlawful for you to take her for wife. And the funny part is, who persecuted him? Remember? The daughter of Herodias danced, and one heard asked her, what do you want? I want the head of John. Who told her to do that? Her mother. He was, he was persecuted by a woman through her daughter, right? Let's summarize what we saw now and compare the points. That's the first Elijah on the left, second Elijah or John the Baptist on the right. Stood up for what is right, he, second Elijah stood up for what is right. The first one had a cutting message of rebuke, the second one he had a cutting message of rebuke as well. First one Elijah restored through worship on Mount Carmel, remember? who? Uh, <coughs> make up your mind who you will worship, if the Lord be God for him, but if Baal, he restored through worship. And second Elijah as well restored through worship. Pointed Israel to the true God, Elijah. Remember they were worshipping idols on Mount Carmel. Elijah said, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. He pointed to the true God. Second, Elijah pointed to the Lamb of God, to Jesus. First, Elijah was persecuted by, a, by an impure woman, an idol worshipper, right? Jezebel. The second, Elijah was persecuted by an impure woman through her. Daughter, now it, it might seem that there's a bit of difference here, but wait until we bring the third Elijah on the picture, and then you see how it all comes in. First Elijah fled into the wilderness, John preached in the wilderness. First Elijah maintained a simple diet, the second one maintained a simple diet also. First one was a Jew, but did not take part of the system. Elijah was a Jew, but he did not do what the rest of the Jews did, did he? He rebuked the king. He did not take part in what his nation did. Yes? 
The second Elijah, the same thing. He was a Jew. But he did not take part in the system. He did not take part in the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He rebuked them. All generation of vipers, he told them. He did not take part in what they did. Yes? His message brought the rain, the first Elijah. Remember? After they accepted his message, he prayed seven times and the rain came. The second Elijah, his message prepared the people to receive Jesus. Through whom the early rain came. Yes? The last point, Elijah was translated to heaven alive. The second Elijah died as a martyr. Seems there's a bit of difference, right? Just persevere with me and we'll see. What about in the last days? Will the Elijah people in the last days meet, match this criteria? Will, they, will the last people, Elijah people in the last days be persecuted by a woman? Do you hear in the scripture, do you read anywhere about a woman that takes part in the closing scenes of this world? Let us examine the scriptures quickly to see. In Revelation 17 we read about what? The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. It's a woman and I want you to notice what's written on her forehead. That's important. We'll get back to it at the end of the study. What's written on her forehead? Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots. She's a woman, she has daughters. She's a harlot, her daughters are harlots. And it's mystery written on her forehead, yes? The same woman is described in Revelation 13 as a beast. We can go through this quickly, we all know it. But I want to point out that in Revelation 13 we are told that all the world wandered after the beast or the same woman, the same system. The whole world wandered after her. Yes? Now has this woman persecuted God's people in the past? Yes. We all know this is old news to us. She continued 40 and 2 months. She perse persecuted God's people for 1260 days or rather years. Will this woman have an unlawful relationship with the kings of the earth and with God's people or supposed to be God's people. Remember Jezebel, she was an idol worshipper. She had an unlawful relationship with Ahab. Ahab was a Jew. He was not supposed to marry non-Jews. Relationship were unlawful. It resulted in worshipping Baal. Yes? Let us see, will this woman have an unlawful relationship? We read in Revelation 18, 3 about the same woman, and all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So the Bible tells us that the kings of the earth will commit fornication with this impure woman. But this doesn't tell us that God's professed God's people will. But if we keep reading, or rather we read in Revelation 13, 11 about the second beast in, second beast in Revelation 13, who is that? Don't be scared. U.S. Yes? What does it represent? Two horns? What do the two horns represent? Thank you. In the tw during the 12, six years when the impure woman was persecuting God's people, where did God's people flee to? Where we are now. The Protestants came to America. It was a refuge to them. It was, in a sense, a Protestant nation, wasn't it? I was, I was uh, watching something on the net. I can't remember who he is. In the Congress, this guy was giving a, a history of... There is, I've never been to the Congress, by the way. But there is uh, four or five big... Uh, what do you call them? Not pictures. Mural. What? Murals. It's a picture called a mural. Yes, yes, of, of the presidents, right? And, and he was showing that these four or five pictures represents three Bible studies and a prayer and something else. Did you know that? Do you know that the presidents of America were preachers and pastors? Did you know that? They used to go preach. Do you know that the, the president of the United States used to give money out of, out of the American fund to preach the gospel? America was a Protestant nation. But again, that's your history, not mine. You'd know it better than I do. Now, <laughs> what will this second beast do? This Protestant nation, the Protestantism, what will they do? Let us continue reading. 
And he, the second beast, exercises all the power of the first beast, the woman, the impure woman, before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So we see here that Protestantism will make the world worship the first beast, the impure woman. This apostate system. But will the Protestant persecute God's people like the daughter of Herodias persecuted John? Keep reading verse 15. You can read the verse all, but I'll just read what's yellow. In yellow we read that they caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That's the second beast. <clears throat> but again, that's old news to most of you, right? So here we see that in the last days, this impure woman that persecuted God's people will, commit, uh, will have an unlawful relationship with the kings of the earth and with those who profess to be God's people. Protestant, Protestantism, regardless which church you belong to, once upon a time were the people that God used. They stood up for what is right. But in the last days we read about them now. All right. Will this relationship between the Protestants and the impure woman cause or lead to worshipping Baal? <clears throat> Revelation 13 verse 4, And they, who is they? Those who wander after the beast, you can read it in context, worshipped who? The dragon. the dragon. Remember we saw that the second beast will cause all the world to worship the first beast? And all those who worship the first beast, all those who follow the first beast, will be worshipping who? The dragon. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say it, the Bible said it. Who is the dragon? Revelation 12 verse 9. Dragon is the devil and Satan. It's all on the screen in front of you. So, let's put this all together. In the last days, there is a woman that will commit fornication, an unlawful relationship with the kings of the earth, and with professed God's people, and will cause God's people, will cause the world to worship Baal or Satan. Now, will the Elijah people in the last days have a cutting message to the world? Yes, yes we all know it. The three angel messages, fear God, it's the everlasting gospel. Angel flying in the midst of heaven having what? The everlasting gospel. To preach unto every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Fear God, give glory to Him and worship Him. Second message, Babylon is fallen, fallen, you all know it. Third one, if anyone worship the beast or his image, we know it, right? So God's people, the third Elijah, in the last days will have a message to give to the world. Let's compare the first Elijah with the third Elijah and see if there is any comparison. I won't put the second Elijah because there is no room on the screen, but I, when we get to these points that there was differences, I'll point them out. First Elijah stands up for what is right, the second Elijah or the third Elijah people will, will stand up for what is right. They have a message, fear God. They have the everlasting gospel. They have a cutting message of rebuke, the last people will have a cutting message of rebuke also. Restored through worship, the Elijah people will restore through worship. We'll talk a bit more about this soon as we go on. Point in Israel to the true God. Point Israel to the true God. Again, I'll expand a bit more now when we go through this. The first Elijah was persecuted by a woman. The second Elijah was persecuted by a woman through her daughter. The third Elijah will be persecuted by a woman and by her daughters. Right? That's what we saw in Revelation. The first Elijah fled into the wilderness. Second one, wilderness. Third one, we saw that for 1260 years, he fled into the wilderness. Maintain a simple diet. The second Elijah maintain a simple diet. Do Adventists know anything about a diet? We call it the health message, right? First one was a Jew but did not take part in the system. The second one was a Jew but did not take part of the system. Guess what? The third one will be a Seventh-day Adventist but will not take part of the system. Seventh day Adventist. What does the name stand for? Hold the Sabbath 
believe in the advent of Christ. Well, I believe that the last people, God's people in the last days will be Seventh-day Adventists, will hold the Seventh-day Adventist faith, but will not be part of the system. Yes? If, 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 we, if prophecy is to be fulfilled, if we are to match the second and the first Elijah, that is to happen. Whether I say it or not, time will prove it. First Elijah, his message brought the rain. The second Elijah, his message brought, prepared the people for Jesus. That brought the rain. The third, their message, the Elijah message, the everlasting gospel, will revive the people to make them realize what they have, what they've forgotten about, which will bring the latter rain about that we have forgotten about. Amen? Was translated to heaven alive? The first one, the second Elijah was died as a martyr, the third Elijah, some will die as martyrs and some will be translated to heaven alive. There's a time of trouble coming in the last days where many of God's people, the faithful one, will be laid to rest, will die as martyrs. Now, a few more points. Remember the Zidonians? Remember? The Zidonians oppressed Israel, God delivered them, Ahab went back and married the Zidonian. The Zidonians oppressed Israel. This corrupt church system, the woman, oppressed God's people for 1260 years. Yes? God delivered the first Elijah. God delivered his people. The Protestants, they came to, to here where we are. Ahab went back and married a Zidonian. We read in Revelation, the Protestants, they went back and committed fornication with the impure woman. Right? The result in Ahab days was worshipping idols, worshipping Baal. And the result in the last days, as we read in the scriptures, all those who after the beast will worship the dragon, which is Satan, Baal. These are just similarities for us to see that what, is, what we're living through, what is happening, what the Bible tells us will happen is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. That's what happened in the days of the first Elijah, in the days of the second Elijah, will happen in the days of the third Elijah. All Israel followed Jezebel's God and all the world will wander after the beast. Alright, now who is this woman, impure woman? And have the Protestant nations committed fornication with her. I'm just building a case in here. We'll go quickly. Let us, let's, let us allow the reformers to identify who this impure system for us is. Because I don't know if we're all here believe the same thing or not. But Martin Luther told us, we here are of the conviction that who? The papacy is the seer of the true and real antichrist. In the end he says here, I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. Now I didn't say that, Martin Luther did. Question, Martin Luther was the founder of the Lutheran Church, right? Have the Lutheran Church went back and committed fornication with this impure woman? Yes. Let us ask them. From the Lutheran World Federation, that's in 2010. Now, I didn't have time to look for uh, newer uh, pictures and uh, statements, but I'm sure a lot more happened since. But here we see Lutheran World Federation President praises Pope Benedict for his personal contribution to the Joint Declaration. <coughs> Said, we believe the same thing on justification. Wasn't it Martin Luther jumped up because he started the Book of Romans? He said, hey! Justification is by faith, not the way you say. No, they said we believe the same thing. Cranmer, one of the founders of the Anglican Church, he said, Whereof it followed, followed Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers and strong reasons. Question, has the Anglican Church committed fornication with the impure woman? Let us ask them. The Archbishop of Canterbury, 
Again, this is 2010. The font is a bit small to read it, but look, a picture speaks a thousand words. There you go. They embrace themselves. But you can read it. That he's welcoming them and happy because of the economical movement and they're trying to work together and trying to get together. They're praying together. They're hugging each other. Once upon a time, the founder of this church said that this man is the Antichrist. Now the founder of this church is embracing this man. John Wesley, Methodist, he said, speaking of the papacy, he said, he is in an emphatical sense the man of sin as he increases all manner of sin above all measure. And he is too properly styled the son of perdition. He goes on to say, he it is that exalteth himself above all that is called God. Again, has the Methodists committed fornication with the impure woman? Let us ask them. Reverend Allison Tomlin is the president of the Methodist Conference, right? That's what year is that? Can you see a year around here? Yeah, 2010. She said, I was delighted because I think it's really important that we go on having proper conversations together, Tomlin said. In England particularly, the Catholic Church has been part of the economical conversations and the economical work we do for some time. We're working together. It's about time we start loving each other and working in unity and... Hey, your father said he's the man of sin. He's the Antichrist. Again, before I read this, <laughs> it's easy to point at other systems, right? What about Seventh-day Adventists? Now, I hold to the Seventh-day Adventist faith. Alright, so don't think I'm... I'm uh, putting anyone down. But what about them? Have they gone back and embraced the woman? Conference clasps hand with the papacy. That's Dr. Bert B. Beach. He's the SDA General Secretary Council on Interchurch. That's in 2001. Shaking hands. Embracing it. As you can see, Protestants are joining hands with Jezebel. They have committed fornication with her. As a result of this fornication, listen to what the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church have to say. That's Mitchell Tyner, the Associate General Counsel for the General Conference, wrote an article. He says, the Pope and I descended from the same father. That makes us brothers who should not go around making personal attacks on each other. Differences, no matter how legit legitimate, even if God says it, would not justify the alienation of a member of the family. After all, the Pope and I are brothers. Come here, my brother. Let me give you a hug. Have the Protestant nations went back and committed fornication with the impure woman? You know what, in the, the sad reality is that in Ahab's case, all Israel ended up worshipping Jezebel's God. Are you hearing me? I want you to be attentive now. If you are sleeping, time to wake up. In Ahab's time, when Ahab married Jezebel, all Israel ended up worshipping who? Baal. 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 7,000 did not. Thank you, except the faithful. Thank you, good point, except the 7,000. But I'm talking about the system, the 7,000 were hiding. When King Ahab said, let all Israel come to Mount Carmel, did the 7,000 go? Because no. they were not part of the system. Now the, the question that I need to ask myself, ask you, is, has this been done? Are all the nations now worshipping spiritual Jezebel's God? of today? Well, who is the God of the impure woman? Let, don't answer, let her answer. See keen faces. <laughs> Let's ask the Pope. The one God whom we worship is a unity of how many? Three, Three divine persons, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, yet one Lord, one God ever to be adored. 
John Paul, the head of the Catholic Church, the head of the impure woman, as the Bible tells us, he said, the God that we worship is made up of three divine persons, but he is one. From the Catholic Catechism, they say, I believe in one God. I'll just read what is underlined in red. You can look it up on the net and, and read it for yourself. It says, the confession of God's oneness. God is one in nature, substance, and essence. Then he says, for there is only one God, the Almighty Father, His only Son, and the Holy Spirit, the most holy, what? Trinity. Trinity. The one God of the woman, the impure woman, according to her, not according to I, not according to me, is made up of three persons, is called the Trinity. Right? And then they say the mystery of the most holy Trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith. Wow, did you catch that? What, what, what did they call the Trinity? A what? Now, do you remember what was written on the forehead of the impure woman in Revelation 17? Could that be related? It's for you to think about. But they said our God is three in one and He's a mystery. Again, they hold to the Athanasian Creed that's from the Catholic Encyclopedia and it says, one of the symbols of the faith approved by the church and given a place in her liturgy. That's the Athanasian Creed and they say that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the person nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, one person of the Son, one of the Holy Ghost, but they are not three gods, they are one God. Right? That's what they say. I didn't say that. <laughs> Can you all agree with what I'm saying so far? I'm just simply reading what they're saying. I'm not saying anything. Amen. That's how they illustrated. That's taken from my Catholic faith. They illustrate it as a triangle. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Is not, is not, is not. And they all equal God. And they say in here, I'll make it larger so you can read it. A good... Concrete illustration of the Blessed Trinity is an equilateral triangle. I believe you'll be seeing a bit more about the equilateral triangle in the next presentation. When another shares. And they go on to say such a triangle has three sides equal and then they jump down to the three persons are equal in every way with one nature and one substance. Three divine persons but only one God. That's the God of the impure woman. She's speaking out, she's saying that is my God. At Ahab's day, we saw when Ahab married Jezebel, Ahab and all Israel ended up worshipping Jezebel's God. We saw half the story fulfilled, that all the, na the Protestant nations in the last days committed fornication with the impure woman, the modern Jezebel. Now the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are these Protestant nations, Ahab of today, that committed fornication with the impure woman, worshipping the same God as the, the impure woman? Yeah. That's what happened in history, but it's a fair question. My word wouldn't have any value. Let us, let us see. We'll ask the Lutheran Church. They say they hold to what? Athanasian Creed. Did you hear that before? We just read it. That's the creed that the Catholic Church holds to. They say, we believe we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the person nor dividing the substance. The Lutheran Church, they said, we hold the same God as the impure woman. I didn't say it, they said it. The Baptist, down here where it's underlined, they say, the eternal triune God reveals himself to us as a Father, Son and Holy Spirit with distinct personal attributes but without division of nature, essence, or being. Three persons, but it's the same God. It's one. Three persons, one God. And you know what they call it? That's from the Theological Seminary website, Albert Mohler. And he says, the Trinity is indeed a what? In the last days, everybody will have something written on their forehead. And I mean everybody. They declared their God is a mystery. Catholic Church declared, declared their God is a mystery. Anglican, they say, and in unity of this Godhead there be three persons of one substance, power and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
And again they say, the same people, Anglican, they say, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. Again, you see, the Protestant nations, Protestant churches, they married the impure woman, they're worshipping her God, and they call it a mystery. I'll just speed up a bit. The Methodists in here, they say, and in unity of this Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power and eternity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The same thing, same God, right? Same God. Who is this one now? The Methodists. They call it a mystery of the Trinity. Yes? I'm just showing you that all these Protestant nations that married Jezebel, they're worshipping the same God and they're declaring it to be a mystery. The impure woman in Revelation 17 have a mystery on her forehead. I'm just bringing things out so you can see. Now, all, all these nations, all these churches were worshipping the God of Jezebel until God sent a group of people, he woke them up. One of their representatives, one of their founders of these people said the following. He said, the greatest fault we can find in the Reformation is the, is the reformers stopped reforming. Had they gone on and onward till they had left the last vestige of papacy behind, such as natural immortality, sprinkling and the what? And Sunday keeping, the church would now be free from her unscriptural errors. Who said that? Have anybody heard of James White? These people were not ignorant of the unlawful relationship. And they were standing up and they were giving a message of rebuke and they pointing people to the true God. But the question is, what about the Seventh-day Adventist church today? What about them today? If, by the way, uh, this is just one statement. There is a book at the back table. I think there is a book. If not, write down this website, revelation1412.org. Revelation1412.org. Brother Nader and myself put the, this website together. There is a book called The Living Voice of the Lord's Witnesses. What is it called? The Living Voice of the Lord's Witnesses. This whole book is a compilation of statements from the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church about this topic. You can explore as much as you want. Remember the website is revelation1412.org. Alright, let's see what the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes today. Let us ask them. This is from Reflection on the Doctrine of the Trinity, page 16 from the Andrews University. That's January 1970. Listen to what they say. We must confess that the Trinity is one indivisible God. And that the distinction of the persons do not destroy the divine unity. This unity of God is expressed by saying that He is one what? We heard this before. Nevertheless, in the divine unity there are three co-eternal and co-equal what? That rings a bell, doesn't it? Who, though distinct, are the one undivided and adorable God. This is the doctrine of scripture. That's what the Seventh-day Adventist theologians teach you today. Another one. That's from the Biblical Research Institute, 2008. And he says, We do not believe in three gods, but one God in three persons. These three personalities participate in one substance. In the divine unity there are three co-eternal and co-equal persons who though distinct are the one undivided God. The three persons share one indivisible nature. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That sounds opposite to what James White said, doesn't it? So as you can see, history repeats itself. Now, do the Seventh-day Adventist theologians say that it's a mystery? Yes. Seventh-day Adventist, Biblical Research in 2006, while the Trinity is a divine what? divine mystery, and no mortal man will ever be able to understand it fully. The scriptural evidence clearly indicates the equality and eternal coexistence of the three persons in the Godhead. While, uh, while human reason may not understand it, by faith we can believe it. Human reason may not what? Last time I read my Bible, in Mark chapter 12, from verses 29 to 33, Jesus had a conversation with a scribe, 
And Jesus told the scribe that the first law is you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Two verses later, the scribe repeated what Jesus said. And he said, yes, Lord, we are to love God with all our heart, with all our understanding. And Jesus told him, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. We are to love God with all our understanding. How can you love God with all your understanding when God is a mystery and you cannot understand? Keep in mind, I'm not talking about the nature of God. That's not what they're talking about. The nature of God, we don't understand it. I can understand how God could be everywhere at the same time. I don't. But we're talking about the identity of God, who God is. That's what these people are talking about. Jesus said you are to love Him with all your understanding. This one said you cannot understand Him. I'd rather go with Jesus. And here is how the Seventh-day Adventist Trinity is illustrated. That's taken from the New Pictorial Aid for Bible Study, page 75. Seventh-day Adventist publication. Does this look familiar? What is the difference other than the angels around them? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing here and trying to bring the Adventist church down or the Methodist church down or any of these churches down. I'm not. I'm simply doing my duty as God told Ezekiel. If you know something, you don't tell my people and they die in their sin, you're responsible. Amen? Amen. As a matter of fact, the papacy challenges the Protestants. And here is the challenge. Our opponents sometimes claim that no belief should be held dogmatically which is not explicitly stated in scriptures. That's what Protestants say. But the Protestant churches have themselves accepted such dogmas as what? The Trinity for which there are no such precise authority in the Gospels. Did you catch that? The impure woman herself She's telling you, you claim to follow the Bible? You claim to be a Protestant? You claim to be a worshiper of God? Well, let me tell you what. Here is to prove if you're a true follower of the Bible or not. The Trinity is not taught in the Bible. You can understand what they're saying by this. We brought it in. If you're a true Protestant, why do you worship the same God we worship? This means you better bow down and follow what we say. They did the same challenge with Sunday as well. But I believe all of us, most of us in here don't face that challenge. But I'm bringing another challenge to us in here. Rather they brought it. I'm just bringing it to attention. So if all this is true, we saw history is being fulfilled. History fulfilled itself. Well, the question that we need to ask ourselves and I want to share with you today is, well, what is the message that Elijah brought so we can bring it? And who is the God that Elijah worshipped and po pointed people to so we can worship him and point people to? Yes? Because at the end of the day, that's what the whole exercise is for. It's not to expose this or expose that or speak badly about this one or that one. It is to point to the true God. Who is our true God? What is the message that Elijah brought? Here is his message. It's found again in 1 Kings 8.21. Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And guess what? What does the scripture say? What did they say? Nothing. They answered him not a word. Why? I, I told you yesterday, I told you that before, I like to ask the question why. Why did they answer him not a word? You see, this deception has crept in so slowly and so secretly that when they came to Mount Carmel, they came face to face with God and they were asked to make a stand to choose. They had no idea what to choose. They were confused. They didn't know anymore. They had no courage to stand up. The same thing happened at the days of Jesus. When John the Baptist po pointed and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The Jews, they had the right book. They had the Torah. They were going to the right place, to the temple to worship. They were doing the right motions. But their brains, their mind was so clouded with the human tradition that they were confused. They took the Lamb of God and they slayed Him. They didn't know who the Lamb of God is. If you think I'm making this up, that's what Jesus said. 
In John chapter 16, verse 1 to 3, he's talking to his disciples. I'll just read the last part in yellow. He said, the reason they will persecute you and do all these things is because they have not known the Father nor me. Talking about the Jews. They had the right book. They had the law. They were going to the synagogue. But they did not know God nor His Son Jesus. Why? Because their mind was beclouded with human traditions and philosophies of men. Then who is our God? I'll go through a very brief, very short Bible study, but again, you can go to the website I referred you to, to other websites, I'm sure. Uh, there's other ministries that have beautiful materials on it. There's DVDs and books in the back table. Help yourself to it. I'll just have a short study, logical study. Who is our God? How many gods do we have? Deuteronomy 6, 4, uh, the Lord our God is one God, one Lord. Again, New Testament tells us the same thing. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, it says, There is none other God but one. one. Who is this one God? Paul answers us very plainly, very clearly. But to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we of Him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. If Paul believed in a trinity, he cannot, he's a liar to say that. He can say that. Because we saw... The, ch the impure woman, her church, sorry, her God, she said, we have one God. It is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Paul said, we have one God. It is the Father. Again, Romans 15, 6, that he may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling you who God is. That is why, remember the woman in Revelation 17, what did she have on her forehead? On her forehead? What God did she worship? Mystery, she said. You know, Trinity and it's a mystery. Now we see God's people, which God do they worship? Who is the God, the true God? We just saw, we read verses. It's the Father. Whose name will they have on their forehead? Revelation 14.1, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on, on the Mount Zion, and with him an 144,000 having what? His father's name written on their forehead. The impure woman worship, worships the Trinity, a mystery God, and has on her forehead mystery. God's true people worship God the Father and have on their forehead the Father's name. This is the 144,000 are the product of the everlasting gospel, the Elijah message being preached in the last days. Amen? Amen. Who, did, who is Jesus? Who did He claim to be? He said in John chapter 10, verse 36, I am the Son of God. How is Christ the Son of God? What does the Bible tell us? John chapter 1, verse 14, He's the only begotten. He's a Son begotten. John 3, 16 as well says the same thing. We all know it. He's a begotten Son. When was Christ begotten of the Father? Malachi tells us, whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. Whose goings forth or whose origin is of the days of eternity. Jesus is eternal, brothers and sisters. And He is not created. Amen? Amen. Jesus is not created. You go as well back to Proverbs chapter 8. We don't have time to go through it. 22 to 25, Jesus speaking there under the title of wisdom and He says, Before anything was created, before anything was made, I was set up. I was brought forth. Jesus speaking. You can look it up for yourself. Now the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit? We don't have a lot of time to go in it. We already passed our time. I'll take less than five more minutes. But I want to read a few verses, two verses, and ask you a logical question. Logic is not illegal, right? I want to ask you logical questions. Mark chapter 2 verse 8. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they saw reason, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Jesus perceived in his spirit. Who perceived? Did Jesus perceive or another being called his spirit? 
Jesus, right? It's, it's, you're looking at me like, what's wrong with you asking such a ridiculous question, right? right? Jesus perceived in his spirit. Another verse, Mark chapter 8, verse 12. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. Who sighed? Jesus sighed deeply in himself or another being called his spirit side? Ridiculous question, isn't it? Jesus side. So when it, Jesus in his spirit, his spirit is referring to Jesus, right? We all agree. Common sense. Last verse, Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, that's on the cross, he said, Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. When Jesus commended his spirit, into his father's hand. Did he commend his own life, himself, his person? Or did he commend another being called my spirit? His own, his own life, right? You all following me? Is it making sense? Are you sure? Is everybody with me? Is it making sense? Okay. What does the father do with the spirit of his son? Galatians 4, 6, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. He said when Jesus sighed in His Spirit, it's Jesus who sighing. When Jesus moaned in His Spirit, it's Jesus who moaned. When Jesus said, into your hands I command my Spirit, Jesus commanded His life. The same thing is said here. Jesus sent, uh, the Father sends the Spirit of His Son. Who is He sending? Is He sending the life, the person, the life of His Son into you? Or is He sending another being called the Holy Spirit? Don't be scared. It's just logic, just common sense, just logic. Right? So just according to these few verses that we read, who is the Holy Spirit? Somebody once, I was preaching this, I can't remember where, maybe in the Solomon Islands or somewhere. And somebody, a pastor, raised his hand and he said, Brother, this is talking about the Spirit of Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. Is the Spirit of Jesus the same as the Holy Spirit? Yes. All that you have to do is compare 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11 and 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, 21. I'll read the first verse first. It says, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, in the prophets that is, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Who was in the prophets that testified? Spirit. Spirit of Christ. Same man, Peter, writing another letter, he says the same thing, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men, the prophets, of God, spake as they were moved by who? The Holy Spirit. He's writing about the same Spirit. He calls it Holy Spirit. He calls it the Spirit of Christ. We just saw that the Spirit of His Son is the life of Jesus. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, who are you receiving? Jesus. The life of Christ. Amen? So are we saying that Jesus is the Holy Spirit? I mean, does the Bible say, does the Bible say Jesus is the Holy Spirit? It does say that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit. Amen. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, He says, But unto us there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ. Now He's saying the Lord is that Spirit. If there is only one Lord, it's Jesus Christ. And the Lord is that Spirit. By substitution, Jesus is that Spirit. If Paul is to come back alive, to stand here today, and he wants to tell you his conviction, he cannot say it in any simpler words. He just said, Jesus is that Spirit. He cannot say it in any simpler words. Amen? Amen? So where does the Bible tell me that Jesus became a Spirit? Does the Bible say Jesus became a Spirit? Yes, it does. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a what? Quickening, Quickening Spirit or a life-giving Spirit. The Bible tells you, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ is Christ Himself. The Bible tells you Jesus was made a Holy Spirit. The Bible tells you the Holy Spirit is Jesus. What more do you want? What more do we ask for? This is our hope of glory, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, Christ 
in you the hope of glory. We can only have this hope of glory if we believe the true identity of the Spirit, that it is the life of Christ Himself. If the enemy can take that away from us, you have no hope of glory anymore. That is what the Antichrist tried to do by introducing his mysterious God. Take away that life from you. Amen? Amen. Again, the Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, not another being. And again, in the last book of the Bible, we are told that it is Jesus who is standing on the heart. I knock on the heart, not another being. Jesus is knocking on your heart. Let me come in. He doesn't want you to open your heart so he can let another person in. He wants to come in your heart. He wants to sup with you and you with him. We have seen, brothers and sisters, that history repeated itself. We have seen as what happened in the days of the first Elijah, happened in the days of the second Elijah, and will, has, and is happening in the days of the third Elijah. The call is yours. Do you want to be an Ahab? Do you want to be a Jezebel? Or do you want to be an Elijah? If you want to be an Elijah, you have to worship Elijah's God. You have to point people to Elijah's God. So you can give the Elijah message, so you can give the everlasting gospel. This gospel, Jesus said, shall be preached unto the ends of the world. This gospel, the gospel that he will build his church on when he told Peter, Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, upon this rock, I am the son of God, I will build my church. Amen? I just pray and hope that the message was clear and that uh, if any of you is still half-minded, you'll pray about it a bit more, You'll ask the Lord if these things are so and you let Him convict you what is true. Amen? Amen.